I welcome you to the annual lecture in Ottoman history. And um, I'm the acting director of Arab American Educational Foundation Center for Arab Studies uh, for the academic year of 2022 and 2023. So, um, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Emine Fetvaci, the Calderwood Professor in Islamic and Asian Art at Boston College. So, um, Professor Fetvaci's research areas include the arts of the book in the Islamic world and Ottoman, Mughal, and Safavid art and architecture. Her first book, Picturing History of the, at the Ottoman Court, was awarded the 2014 Fuat Köprülü Book Prize by the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. Her latest monograph, uh, The Album of the World Emperor, Cross-Cultural Collecting and Album Making at the Ottoman Court, has been nominated for the 2021 Charles Rufus Mori Award of the College Art Association. Her most recent project examines artistic connections between the Ottoman and Mughal empires, and Fetvaci is also the editor with Erdem Chipa of Writing History at the Ottoman Court. Her first book and the co-edited volume have been both translated into Turkish. Her articles have appeared in the leading journals of this field. She has held a Stanford University Mellon postdoctoral fellowship, as well as being a member at the Institute for Advanced Study, Princeton, as well as serving a postdoc position here at Rice for one year, if I'm not mistaken. So, in a sense, um, uh, we had a recent event for Dr. Elora Shehabettin, and I called it, this, this was a homecoming. I think this is kind of homecoming for you, too. <laughs> so. After completing her PhD at Harvard, the, Dr. Fetvaji was an assistant professor in Boston University, and then she joined to Boston College in 2021 as the Calder Calderwood professor. Um, I want to emphasize the significance of this appointment. Um, today, during our lunch, Emina and I, we were trying to cite how many endowed chairs there were in the United States for Islamic art or Asian art. I think we can barely come up with five to 10 probably. And she's one of them, so. And um, the fact that she is holding one of these positions is a testament to her scholarly achievements and productivity. So, and thankfully, the number of academic jobs in this field has been increasing. Uh, there are many reasons for that increase, but I want to single out a particular one because I think this strikes a core chord with this audience. Um, the shifting population demographics in this society triggered a new interest in this field, as well as in the fields related to that, such as Arab studies. As has been emphasized repeatedly by my colleagues, Houston is the only city in the United States that has uh, three endowed chairs in Arab studies funded by the local Arab community. And it is thanks to their generosity, thanks to the generosity of this community, uh, we are able to host our distinguished guest as the annual lecturer in Ottoman history of Arab American Educational Foundation Center for Arab Studies. So without further ado, I welcome Emine. Thank you, let me start also by Thanking Jihan and thanking Fadi for organizing everything uh, um, for my trip. And of course, I'm really grateful to the University of Houston and the Arab American Education Foundation for the invitation. It's uh, really quite an honor um, and a pleasure to be here, especially um, after so many years and when it's snowing in Boston. So thank you for bringing me to the warm weather. Um, I um, should say that I, I wanted to give you the best images possible, which I think in the end meant that I created a monster file, so my slides move a little slowly. I apologize for that in advance. Um, but let me start. During the second half of the 16th century, the Ottoman court produced an unprecedented number of illustrated accounts of their own dynasty. These exquisitely produced, beautifully painted manuscripts were integral to the Ottoman court's perpetuation of an imperial identity and the self-presentation of the ruling elite. The books varied in content. Some described the reign of a particular sultan. Others focused on the military campaigns of a courtier. And so what I have on the screen on the left is a painting from uh, a book that is about the military campaigns of one courtier. And he's seated at the head of the table. He's feasting his officers before they go over to Iran. 
And on the right is a scene from one of those histories dedicated to the reign of one ruler, Sultan Suleiman, um, who ruled between 1520 and 66. And some others, which will be my focus today, were universal histories that fit the Ottoman dynasty into a long line of rulers, including Old Testament kings and pre-Islamic Persian heroes from the Shahnameh, the Book of Kings, the medieval epic um, of uh, Iran, which tells the stories of um, pre-Islamic kings and heroes um, of Iran. A vast number of such histories were created with production intensifying during the second half of the century with the establishment of the post of official court historian in 1555. While the earlier examples were written in Persian verse, Ottoman Turkish prose came to be preferred for many, but not all, of the books made from the 1580s onwards. The illustrated accounts of the dynasty were kept in the palace treasury and circulated among courtiers as well as the young palace trainees who would form the future generations of the ruling elite. As a result, these books disseminated a particular vision of empire and a shared understanding of the past to the upper echelons of Ottoman society. As Ottoman courtiers and palace trainees read and viewed these books, they were faced with idealized images of the society they, they were living in. The books reinforced courtiers' knowledge of their own places within social hierarchies and taught those who were still undergoing their training at the palace about the community they had recently joined. While other artworks, such as textiles and ceramics, could and did signal belonging to the Ottoman elite through a shared visual idiom, and the bold flowers you see on the screen here very much embody that idiom, illustrated histories aided acculturation through their content as well as their aesthetic properties. These manuscripts were shaped by varied notions of an ideal state structure and court hierarchy, together with the interests of their patrons and makers. The diverse visions of the ideal sultan and his relationship to his subjects presented in these books were based on current changing political discourses in which multiple viewpoints were represented. So while some emphasized a militaristic ideal for the Ottoman ruler, others focused on his moral qualities. In addition to political realities and linguistic preferences, the books were shaped by the historiographical and artistic traditions to which they belonged. The earlier Ottoman illustrated histories demonstrate a heavy conceptual debt to the Shahnameh of Firdosi. Um, okay, they demonstrate a, a heavy conceptual debt. Many of the earlier Ottoman histories were written in Persian verse, just like the Shahnameh, in the same meter and the same rhyme scheme as the Shahnameh. So formally, they're directly based on this um, epic. Um, but also their contents, the themes, were inspired by Firdosi's epic as well. And most of them favorably compare the Ottoman Sultan with Shahnameh heroes. So the scenes that we see on the screen uh, Sultan Suleiman basically feasting in the palace on the right and going on campaign on the left, embody two of the three or four themes that one sees throughout the Shahnameh, feasting and fighting, but also dispensing justice. Those are the three sort of roles in which you see the ruler over and over again, both in the Shahnameh and also in these Ottoman um, histories of the Ottoman court. Um, the authors of the illustrated Ottoman works were also inspired by other modes of writing, in particular the Menakup Nami, the lives of holy figures, and the Gazaname, or the war narrative traditions. This is evident in the focus on a single person as the hero whose exploits are recounted in a book, such as one dedicated to the reign of a single sultan, paralleling the life and deed modes of a Menakup Nami. The emphasis on military achievement is, also, of course, a clear link to the, the war narrative, Gazaname tradition. The Ottoman dynastic histories were expected to evoke the illustrated Shahnameh tradition. That, sorry, that Ottoman dynastic histories were expected to evoke the illustrated Shahnameh tradition is evident 
in the creation of a court position called the Shehnameji, the one created in 1555. It's literally called the Shahnameh writer, but his job is to write the history of the, of the Ottoman dynasty. Um, Fethullah Arif Çelebi was the first holder of this office. He was tasked by Sultan Suleiman to compose an illustrated verse history of the Ottomans in Persian. Arif titled his work, The Shahnameh of the House of Osman. This was a universal history in five volumes, which began with the tales, well, began with creation, um, Adam and Eve, and the tales of Old Testament prophets, and included Shahnameh heroes as well, continued into the Ottoman period, and detailed the reign of Sultan Suleiman in its final volume, the Suleiman Name, or the Book of Suleiman. While the text's links with the Shahnameh are obvious, and are clearly, by design, very deliberate, it's also important to note that the artists working on the project were inspired by Shahnameh illustrations. The compositions that we see um, here on the screen build very closely on Shahnameh images of feasts, of hunts, of battles, and as I said, the dispension of justice um, uh, for, for the most part. The Suleiman Nami visually presents Suleiman hunting and doing battle, but also holding audience with ambassadors, his commanders, and his subjects. The punishment of rebels, the conquest of cities and castles, and the execution of prisoners are recurrent themes in the paintings, which highlight his military prowess and his justice. Scenes such as hunting wild animals, going to war, or dispensing justice are, in a sense, depictions of the Ottoman ruler enacting the legendary feats of the Shahnameh heroes. The ideal Ottoman ruler is thus rendered more concrete through the images, especially when they have compositional or iconographic similarities to well-known images from these earlier um, Shahnameh books. One example that is not military but tightly connected to other Shahnameh tropes has been described in detail by Fatma Sinam Aryilmaz and is useful for illustrating my point here. This is the image that you see on the right, the image of Suleiman drinking from a ruby red cup, which you can see him um, holding up in his right hand. Um, <clears throat> And the cup is described in the adjacent text as the cup of Jamshid. Jamshid is one of the heroes in the Shahnameh. It was presented according to uh, this narrative. This cup was presented to Suleiman by one of his courtiers on the eve of a campaign against the Safavids of Iran. So it's very pointed that he has the cup of a Persian ruler the night before he's going to invade Iran. Arif, the, the, the poet, also specifies that the cup was seen by Adam and then passed through the hands of various kings of the Shahnameh. He names them, actually, in, in the text, starting with Gayo Mars, who is one of the first um, rulers named in the Shahnameh, and continuing, of course, with Jemshid himself, but also including many others, such as Alexander the Great, who is one of the heroes in the Shahnameh, Kehusro, and Anushirvan the Just, renowned, as you can guess, for his justice. In addition to concretely showing Suleiman as the heir to this extraordinary heritage just on the eve of his campaign against Iran, the image makes use of the audience's knowledge of Shahnameh illustrations and visual tropes to strengthen the eulogy of the ruler as Shahnameh hero. Suleiman is depicted in full fighting and feasting mode in images such as the ones I have on the screen. However much Ottoman historians admired the Shahnameh, I want to move on from it. It was never the only ideal behind their creations, and it would be simplistic to hold it up as the only model for the illustrated Ottoman history. Even the Shahnameh Ali Osman, the book that I have been showing you, an explicitly Shahnameh-inspired work, right? It's there in its title, its form is based on it. It drew upon other sources to visualize the ideal ruler. Only volumes 
1, 4, and 5 are extant today. Volumes 2 and 3 don't exist anymore. Perhaps they were never finished. We don't actually know. And the first two, volumes 1 and 4, are in a private collection, have not been published in great detail. A few images have appeared, and are not easily accessible for research. So we, as art historians, have tended to take the Suleiman Name, the final fifth volume, whose visual program is most in line with Shahname ideals as representative of the whole project. However, when the Shahname Ali Osman project is considered, Suleiman appears as more than a Shahname hero, and the project as a whole emerges as one connected to other forms of literary, historical, and political writing beyond the epic. Here in my discussion of these images, I'm drawing on the work of Fatma Sinem Arilmaz, who studied um, this manuscript as well as the Suleiman Name for her dissertation and also has published a few articles in which these two images appear. So as she also makes perfectly clear, the five volumes together make an argument for Suleiman as a prophet-like king. And the idea of the perfect man in Sana Kamil uh, which is a, uh, an Islamic and a Sufi notion, to characterize him. Ariel Maz makes a strong case that the stories illustrated in the first volume, in Biyaname, the Book of Prophets, um, which includes events from the lives of Adam, Cain and Abel, Seth, Idris, Jamshid, the Persian hero or king we encountered, Zahak, who's also a, a figure from the Shahnameh, Noah, a name probably many of you know, and the Prophet Muhammad, provides some of these models. The positively depicted heroes such as Adam, Idris, and Jamshid embody both earthly and spiritual leadership and serve as forerunners to Suleiman. In fact, in the article in which these two images appear, Ariel Maz makes the case that Adam is supposed to be the model for Suleiman. Um, the idealized image of Suleiman draws upon both Quranic and Old Testament figures and Shahnami heroes. <clears throat> Although the bulk of the Suleiman Name visual cycle leans toward Shahnami style feasting and fighting imagery, it's been argued that a few of the 65 illustrations where the ruler is seated on his golden throne amplify this um, connection between him and uh, Adam. The golden halo-like shape created around Suleiman's head in the two images. Um, Ariel Maz interprets this as um, reminiscent of prophetic imagery from other manuscripts where you see prophet figures with flaming gold halos behind their backs. Um, I don't quite agree with her here because of the other depictions of Suleiman sitting in other thrones, and the golden throne was, was actually a, a, um, a historical object. It's still... Uh, so, but I, rather, I think it's the written text and the coupling with the previous volumes that makes the strongest case for prophetic prefigurement. Arif's words in the Suleiman Name clearly present Suleiman as having unified political might with spiritual perfection. Moreover, this is a characteristic we find in the public image fashioned for Suleiman through written texts ranging from law codes to architectural inscriptions to diplomatic correspondence. These present him not only as the last world emperor, but also the only person other than the Prophet Muhammad who perfectly combined the qualities of a spiritual and earthly ruler. Even in this most obviously and clearly Shahnameh-inspired work then, there are other models underlying the idealized presentation of the Ottoman ruler, as well as the overall conception of the historiographic project. These emerge partly from the broader political discourse, but also from other tangible models, such as the books available to historians and painters in the palace collections, to which I briefly want to turn. Current state of research does not provide exact answers as to what these models may have been, but it's possible to suggest some likely candidates. The purpose of doing so is not 
at all to suggest that Ottoman historians or artists were not capable of producing original works, but to better understand the intellectual and artistic traditions of which they were a part. Everything we know of artistic production in the Ottoman court indicates that the artists of the book regularly consulted the earlier works in courtly collections. In the case of the Ottoman palace, we have a solid record of the books kept in the treasury being available to those working in the palace, and that's about 2,000 people. The visual and material evidence stretching all the way to the 18th century shows a keen awareness of earlier masterpieces among artists of the book. When one considers um, models of universal history that might have inspired Arif, the first one that comes to mind is Rashid al-Din's magnum opus, the Jami al-Tawarikh, the Compendium of Chronicles, which is probably the best known universal history of the Persianate world. Despite the obvious parallels between these two works, however, and I really wanted this to be the case, but I realized that the illustrated copies of the Jami al-Tawarikh currently in the Topkapı um, didn't arrive there until the end of the 16th century. So they weren't there in time. But there were unillustrated versions um, of the text. So it's highly unlikely that they were the visual models, but it could easily have been the model for how to conceive of history. Another possible model, um, this one also propo proposed by um, Aryulmaz, is al Qasai's stories of the prophets, the Qasas al-Anbiya. However, again, the illustrated versions of these, in fact, were not even made until the 1570s, so clearly, visually, they can't have been the models. There are other possibilities, but again, um, not the images and text, but the texts serve as, as possible models. So, although the Shahnameh Ali Osman might take some of these universal histories or stories of prophets as models, its paintings thus far appear to be original creations that strive to make a locally relevant point. And that point is to present Suleiman not only as a ruler, but also as an heir to prophets, diverging from the Shahnameh tradition, but coming close to what we find in the political thinking of the era. This is where the slides are slow, but it will come. While the text of the Shahnameh Ali Osman makes a strong case that its images for the Ottoman ruler a stronger case than its images for the Ottoman ruler as heir to prophets, by the 1580s, so 25, 30 years later, the visual cycles of Ottoman histories also strongly emphasize the same ideal. So the images kind of play a, a catch-up game. The words present him in one way first, and then 30 years later, the pictures also start to show him in this way. A prime example is the illustrated Zubdetu Tevari, or the quintessence of histories, a universal history slash genealogy written in Ottoman prose, so not in Persian verse, finished in 1583 and illustrated um, between 1583 and 1586. This is essentially a book of genealogy that connects the Ottoman dynasty back to Noah specifically, but of course, Noah descends from Adam, so to Adam as well. And, but this project too has its origins in the reign of Suleiman. The book is based on the imperial scroll begun by the historians of Suleiman, Arif and his um, successor, Eflatu. Now, there is no way that the images on the screen can give you a sense of this object. It is 31 meters long, which is 102 feet, and its width is 80 centimeters, so about two and a half, or a bit more than two and a half feet wide. It's a scroll. It's an extraordinary thing. I mean, it's 15 times my height, right? It's huge, and it's rolled up. It's very difficult to read. It's awkward to maneuver, and a scroll was not, scrolls were not used at this time, except perhaps for short imperial decrees that might be read out loud in public, but those would be at most this long. Like, compared to this, that's like a legal notepad, right? This is an extraordinary object. So clearly it was made to, to be an extraordinary thing. Um, 
so it was begun for Suleiman, but then um, later, the um, court historian who worked for Suleiman's grandson, Murat III, and his great-grandson, Mahmoud III, expanded it. So currently, there's a bit added to the end which covers three other sultans, which make, brings it up to, you know, 31.16 meters. Um, it's, the, it's an unwieldy object that's difficult to unroll and difficult to read. I mean, the text that you see on the screen goes all the way across, and you have to literally move, well, from right to left, you have to actually move to be able to read it. Other parts of it, like the part around the celestial sphere, um, is written at different angles. So how are you going to turn a scroll? Well, obviously it has to be rolled up, but still very difficult to manipulate. Probably people moved around it rather than moving the object. But it's a really complicated, um, uh, complicated thing. It's covered with very dense text that's organized at times in geometric strips, geometric shapes, sorry. Other times, right, runs straight across in lines that are too long for the eye to follow from a stationary point. After a detailed description of the heavens and earth with which it begins, the scroll turns into a genealogical tree that has three branches. So the images that I have in the last two um, columns are uh, showing you this genealogical part. There's the central branch, which is the most important. It has the biggest medallions in it. And then there are two other branches on the left and right. Um, if you look at the top image at the center, you'll see in that green circle, there are two white circles. One of them says Adam, the other one says Eve. And it goes down, or Adam and Hava, and it goes down from there. The large uh, green medallion in the, in the lowest image at the center has uh, the name Mohammed, that's the prophet Mohammed. And the two images that I have on the right-hand side show, the, Ottoman, show the, the medallions of the Ottoman rulers. So they are smack in the center, Adam and Eve, Mohammed, other important figures, and then, and then uh, Suleiman and his ancestors, but also then Murat, and, uh, Murat is added to it as well. So um, the central branch is the most visually embellished and thus probably most prestigious one. It's also in the middle. It includes Seth and some of his descendants, Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Solomon, Jesus, the prophet Muhammad, and the four caliphs, the first four caliphs of, of Sunni Islam, and ends with the Ottoman sultans. Persian kings, the heroes of the Shahnameh, are included in the left branch, and the right branch includes the leaders of various Sufi paths, as well as rulers from the Islamic past, such as the Abbasids, the Fatimids, who ruled over Egypt, the Ayyubids, also ruled over Egypt, and various Turkic states. These were all identified by Sinem Aryalmaz in her dissertation on the Shahnameh writers of Suleiman, and I'm very much building on her work here. The conception of the Zubde Tevari, the quintessence of histories, dates back to the same period as that of the Shahname, Islam, uh, of the Shahname Ali Osman, of the Shahname of the House of Islam, Osman, because um, the Zubdet Tevari, the manuscript I'm focusing on today, takes the text of the genealogical scroll and turns it into a codex format. In the introduction, um, it says very explicitly that it's a text that was begun for Sultan Suleiman during his reign, etc. So it's explicit about where it's coming from. It's expanded a little bit and transformed into a very large format illustrated codex. So this one, these pages are about this high and about this wide. So they're also kind of difficult to read, but not as difficult as, as the scroll. Um, in a very unusual move for the Ottoman Imperial Manuscript Workshop, Three copies were made, and I'm showing you images of the same scene from the three copies. One was made for the Sultan, one was made for the Grand Vizier, his Prime Minister, basically, and one was for, made for the Chief Palace Eunuch, all between 1583 and 1586. 
While this particular Grand Vizier was not in office for very long, these three positions, the Sultan, the Grand Vizier, and the Chief Eunuch, were the most powerful positions in the court during the 1580s, showing us the importance attached to the project. The title, Zubdetu Tevari, the quintessence of histories, is the same name given in the text of the scroll by the original author of the scroll. The close dependence of this book on the scroll is evident from the lines of genealogy that now run over the pages. So if you look at the two pages that I have on the right, those horizontal lines are basically the, the lines that we saw in the genealogical scroll, but now they go across the pages. And what I find really fascinating is that they don't go into the margins. The margins are very carefully left blank. So, on the one hand, there's a, an awareness of, of this object you know, and its connection to the scroll and the importance of continuing these lines. At the same time, they're up acknowledging the, the materiality of this book and the frames of the book, because that's what a book looks like. The text, the content stays in the middle, the frames are something else. So for me, as, as an art historian, it's really interesting to think about this object in these terms. It's almost like the scroll was cut up and pasted into the text block of, of the book. The lines drawn between different generations go across pages, interrupted with medallions filled with names. The text is written in different portions, so the story that you have on the top part of the page goes with the image that's on the top part, and then actually it doesn't continue into the lower part. You have to turn the page to continue the story again in the top part of the page. So there are so, so it's, a, it's not a, con I mean, it is a continuous book, but it doesn't go the way books normally go. Um, the emphasis, so the images also uh, break the page into two. As you can see, in all of these, there are actually two things happening. Um, on the left and the right, it's easier to separate the scenes because there's a line that clearly cuts across. In the middle, the two scenes seem to be superimposed on each other, but these are two moments from the life and the story of Abraham. Um, uh, in the left and right, the top part has him thrown into the, shows him thrown into the fire, and the lower part is about him uh, sacrificing his son. The folio in the middle inverts this, so the lower part has Abraham in the fire, and the upper part has Abraham about to sacrifice Isaac. Um, so the emphasis on the emphasis visually in this book is very much on the lines and on the continuity. So just like the scroll, uh, and it's uh, and the lines are there to remind us that this comes from a scroll, which tells me that the most important thing here is that this is a genealogy. More than the content of of the stories in any way is this idea of connection from Adam and Eve to Noah to Suleiman, to then Murat, who is the sultan for him, this book is made. Um, and what this does is it praises the Ottoman dynasty by connecting them to these figures, underlining the, the, the parallels between them. The genealogy it presents for the Ottoman sultans is the perfect embodiment of what 16th century Ottoman scholars were fabricating in their works, a noble lineage that infused Abrahamic, Persian, and Turco-Mongolian traditions of origination that not only tied the Ottoman dynasty to prestigious empires of antiquity, but also Islamized its lineage and portrayed it as divinely ordained to rule. Genealogy is not only emphasized by the gold lines of succession, the images and the texts also underline this theme. Halife, or successor, or caliph, is the term frequently used in the text to re refer to important figures. For example, in the text, um, a a and the idea of continuation from one generation to the other is emphasized in the story. So in the text, Moses picks Joshua as a successor, and the word used is Khalifa, and Isaac is shown at the moment of investing the wrong son, Jacob, with prophecy rather than Esau, who was his favorite, at least according to the text of, of, the, of the Zubdet. The ark that Ishmael receives in the illustration of his story contains the golden bowl in which all the hearts of the prophets that came before him had been washed, 
which signals him as the heir to all of these other prophets. The stories of Joseph and Moses are linked verbally by the statement that Jacob and his progeny, Joseph's father, right, were 72 people when they went into Egypt. And when Moses led them out, they were 600,570. Less obvious connections are also provided by the text so that Elijah saves the baby Jonas, thus linking two otherwise unrelated stories and creating a sense of continuity and genealogy in the entire manuscript. <clears throat> the copy prepared for the Grand Vizier Sievush Pasha, it's going to come in a minute, um, contained 40 narrative scenes of prophets and kings before the prophet Muhammad. Yes. Of these, two depict Alexander the Great and one shows Gayumar, so, and these two are Shahnami figures. The other 38 are biblical scenes and also includes the ascension of Jesus. The Shahnami, although present, via Alexander and Gaia Mars, is clearly not central to this narrative at all, but the prophets are. This is in perfect accordance with a strong strain of contemporary political thinking that linked the Ottoman Sultanate to prophethood and ideally conceived the Sultanate as the type of rulership inspired by God's governance and modeled after the rulership of ruler prophets. Um, the scenes I've identified for you on the screen, I think, underline this um, this theme. The last narrative image in the book, which will appear in a second, is that of the Prophet Muhammad. He is seated as if holding audience, so he's the one in green with a veil covering his face and a fantastic um, flaming halo behind him. It's hard to miss him. He's seated as if holding audience, the way the Ottoman rulers are pictured in, in narratives from the time. Inside a domed pavilion, highly reminiscent of the palace scenes from the Suleiman Name, the ones where I showed Suleiman on the golden throne. In each one, he was in, a, in a, a pavilion just like this. But in this case, this is meant to evoke a mosque. Behind him, we see a minbar um, to the right, the, those stepped uh, pulpit-like uh, structure that you find in mosques, and to his left is a mihrab, indicating the direction of prayer. Shorthand for showing that this is, this is a mosque. Um, the angel Gabriel is right behind the prophet, and other angels can be seen in the upper part of the image, partly through the gold flaming halo of the prophet. After this, this last narrative scene, all the images in the book, they're coming, are portraits. Come on. Um, the Prophet Muhammad is followed by the four caliphs, Sunni Islam, the 11 imams of the Shiite tradition. There we go. Um, so on the top, top left are the four imams, uh, sorry, the four caliphs that according to Sunni accounts are the f four followers of the Prophet Muhammad that ruled over the Islamic community. And then the next two images in the middle on top are the 11 Imams, and it's interesting that there are 11 and not 12. The Safavids, who are the Ottomans' neighbors and rivals at this time, are 12 Shiites, and they believe that the 12th Imam went into occultation, so he's not here. That's why there are 11 of them. And then on the right, those guys with the big white turbans are the four jurists of the four legal schools of Sunni Islam. So it's very ecumenical in its conception. And then we have the portraits of the Ottoman sultans. So in terms of the visual cycle of this manuscript, we have all the narrative scenes of the prophets and a couple of Shahname figures that I've been showing you, and then portraits. And the, Ottomans, the Ottoman rulers, each one is shown in a portrait. So all 12 of them up to Murat are here. So the format, narrative versus portrait the genre very much makes, makes a case for continuity with these Islamic figures. Um, let's see. The, the portrait format, as I said, makes it clear that the Ottoman rulers follow in the footsteps of those religious figures that came before them and are equally integral to the history of Islam. 
The book presents an ideal for the Ottoman ruler that heavily leans on Islamic Sufi notions. Ottoman rulers are conceived here as caliphs, or successors, heirs in a way, to the Prophet Muhammad. The imperial copy made for the Sultan Murat III, from which these two images come, is especially compelling in this way. It depicts the first four caliphs of Islam on the left and Murat III on the right. If you look at the way in which they're all seated, cross-legged, they're each one of them, except for one of the caliphs, is underneath a bracketed arch, which is a very specific architectural um, uh, format. Uh, they each have an attendant with them on the left, and the Ottoman Sultan on the right has two attendants. And in, you probably haven't noticed, but in all of the images of the Ottoman rulers that we've seen in all of the narrative scenes, all the Shahnam, all, all the Suleiman Name scenes, there are two attendants behind the sultan. That's, it's like they're his attributes. You know him from the attendants. Well, the caliphs here are given the same attendants so that you, you see the visual connection between the ruler's portraits and the, um, and, and the, and the, uh, the, the caliph's portraits. Um, in a way, uh, uh, my colleague and friend, Baaki Tezjan, argues that the Zubdetu Tevari presents the Ottoman dynasty as the seal of the dynasties, just as the Prophet Muhammad is conceived as the seal of the prophets, the last one. Given that the scroll on which this book is based was originally composed for Suleiman, who, as discussed earlier, was indeed eulogized as the perfect man, like the Prophet Muhammad, this makes a lot of sense. The Zubdet, um, which we're looking at here, in many ways updates the scroll, so the eulogy formulated for Suleiman can be applied to his grandson Murad III, but with a slight shift in emphasis. One of the central concerns of the text here is leading people to the right path, or as, as the author Lokman phrases it, bringing people to belief. While this is understandable <clears throat> for its close link to the job description of a prophet, it also relates, of course, to contemporary concerns, religious um, uh, disagreements, age of confessionalization, etc. So it's, it's a very contemporary issue. And the Ottoman self adopted view of their role in the Islamic world, especially vis a vis their Shiite neighbors, the Safavids of Iran. And that's why it's really interesting in that case to see the, pro the images of the 11 um, Imams that I showed you earlier. But it must be remembered that this book was made for Murat specifically. With his strong, Murad has very strong Sufi, uh, Sufistic leanings, and his lifestyle was very different from his grandfather, Suleiman's. While Suleiman spent a lifetime on horseback, going on campaign and hunting, after his accession to the throne, Murad barely ever left the palace. Yet his commanders were busy fighting the Safavids for large parts of his reign. So the militaristic Shahname ideals could not be used to eulogize Murat. It would almost appear like they're making fun of him. The different choices made in the depictions of these two rulers in these images, which I'm going to uh, discuss in uh, a little bit now, makes the underlying logic of the Zubdet Tevari clear. While Suleiman is depicted on the right with the cup of Jamshid, which I've already um, uh, told you about, on the left, Murat III is depicted with the sword of the prophet held by his sword bearer beside him. The historian Lokman tells us in the text that the discovery of the prophet's sword had been foretold early in the reign of Murat III by a dream that Sheikh Muslihuddin had. In the Sheikh's dream, the Sultan, upon the Prophet's order, took out the sword from the well that it had fallen into. The owner of the sword, a certain man named Suleiman, a descendant of the Mamluk ruler, by Bars al Bandukhtari, inherited it from his family and had a vision where the Prophet Muhammad told him to pass the sword to Sultan Murat. This is all Lokman's account. The sword was then sent to Istanbul as a gift for the Sultan. 
Just as Arif recounts in the Suleyman Nami, the hands through which Jamshid's cup passed, starting with Adam, um, Lokman here lists the previous owners of the sword. The Mamluk ruler by Bars al Bunuktari, who inherited it from the Abbasids in Baghdad, who in turn got it from the Umayyads, who had got it from the Caliph Umar, to whom the Prophet had given the sword himself. So this image on the left and the accompanying text makes it crystal clear that Sultan Murat was the heir to the Prophet Muhammad's legacy. While prophetic history is important in general terms in the manuscript, the most important of those prophets was, of course, the Prophet of Islam. As with the Shahnameh Ali Osman, the five-volume project with which I began, Earlier histories held in Ottoman collections probably inspired the Zubde to Tevari as well. With the same caveats of we still don't know a lot, we can point to a few uh, possibilities. Um, in his introduction to another work that he wrote, the author Lokman, the historian whose Zubde to Tevari we've been looking at, um, he names two sources, Firdosi, the author of the Shahnameh, is one, and he also names Tabari, the um, uh, medieval Arab historian. Neither author writes about the Ottoman period, of course, because they came before, so Lokman wouldn't have consulted, consulted these books for their factual information on Ottoman history, but he may have done so for an overarching vision of history. Or we might consider what he's doing as simply name dropping because that's what you do. These, these are great historians of the past and I looked at them and I'm just like them. Showing that he knows who the important historians are. Um, it's like the introduction of many dissertations, right? The lit review. Um, uh, but Lokman's mention of Tabari is an important clue as to the kind of writing that he is familiar with. And it's very tempting to me to postulate that he's referring to a specific manuscript that is currently in Istanbul. This is, and it will appear in a second, um, the Timurid era Persian historical compilation, sometimes referred to as the Kuliyat Tarihi, Compendium of Histories, and that contains, among other historical texts, it's an anthology of sorts, it's a compilation of, of different historical bits. The very beginning part is a Persian translation by the author Balami of Tabari's history of kings and, uh, uh, and prophets. The book bears the seal of the Timurid prince, Badi Azaman Mirza, who was brought to Istanbul in 1514 when Selim I conquered Tabriz, which is where the prince had been living. It's possible, but of course by no means certain, that the book came with him to Istanbul, and that's where it still is in the Ottoman treasury. As um, documented by Eleanor Sims, the Tabari Balami portion of this text is the only portion of the compilation that's illustrated. So it's Oh, I forget now the exact folio count, but there are like 400 folios. Only the first 100 have illustrations and the other 300 don't. The topics of the illustrations, which I've put some of them on the screen for you, match up so closely with the, those in the Zubde de Tevari. Um, they're mostly biblical scenes. We have Noah and the giant Uj, who in the Zubde are in different images, but here they're brought together on the, on the upper left. Um, there's an image I haven't put here, Salih and the camel, it appears in both texts. We have Nimrod casting Abraham into the flames in the middle, up top. You see the, um, the flames in the margin and the, the catapult machine is at this, as the center. We have Abraham preparing to sacrifice his son on the upper right. We have Moses' rod turning into a serpent, uh, lower left and Alexander building the wall against Gog and Magog, which appear in both manuscripts. Moreover, the illustrated folios have Ottoman inscriptions. So the, the text is Persian in black, but the red inscriptions you see in the margins are in Ottoman. And they explain the scenes, um, and they're very similar in format and placement to, similar to, to inscriptions found above the images in Ottoman histories 
from the 16th century, including um, some folios of the Zudetu Tevari itself. So we can at least be certain that the books were handled in the same contexts. There are quite a few similarities beyond the choice of subject matter. The scenes of Moses and the Pharaoh, for example, where Moses' staff has been turned into, and the text says serpent, but here it's very much a dragon, uh, is particularly striking. The dragon with swirls of fire around its legs and its open mouth breathing fire towards the Pharaoh, Moses' calm stance and his flaming halo, and the surprise on the enthroned Pharaoh's face are repeated both here and in the, in the Zubdet Tevari. I should have put them together, sorry. Um, the images of Alexander building the wall against Gog and Magog, or the figure, the giant figure of Uj, as well as Noah's Ark against the stormy gray background further connect these manuscripts. Although far from exhaustive, the similarities between these images, at times in terms of iconography, other times in terms of compositional elements, suggest that Ottoman artists were very much aware of this manuscript or other Timurid precedents. The Topkapı treasury where this book was kept was an important resource for all of the manuscript projects created in the palace. The recent publication of the 1501-1502 inventory of the, big, of the books in the imperial treasury adds important pieces of information to our knowledge of the contents. Cornell Fleischer and Kaya Shahin, who analyzed the works of a historical nature in the inventory, make the point that the mere preparation of this inventory, the, its organization by subject matter, is a clear sign that the books were consulted by a sizable group of people. It's important to remember that many of the books, that many books were added to the treasury after the inventory was made and before the period in which the illustrated histories examined to, uh, here were made. Selim I's incursions into Iran and conquests of Syria and Egypt, for example, expanded the treasury collection significantly. Nonetheless, there are two pieces of information from the 1501-02 treasury that are um, important for us. Among the few illustrated works therein was an illustrated history of Genghis Khan, and the works of historical nature in the collection were skewed towards Timurid and Persian history. The books of a historical nature are organized into two groups, Siyar and Tevari. The, um, the first phase of history proper, according to the compiler of the inventory, Atufi, began with Sier, so the lives of, uh, um, lives basically, which included a few examples of the histories of prophets, but mostly concentrated on the life of the prophet Muhammad, on which there were multiple works in the treasury. Fleischer and Shahin write, and I quote, in the compiler's understanding, history proper is a process that starts with the prophet Muhammad and continues with the caliphs and the story of the Islamic community in general with its scholars and other prominent members. This conception of history is also discernible in the Shahnameh Ali Osman and the Zubdetu Tevari projects. Interestingly enough, the works in the treasury were organized in a way to suggest that Atufi, the compiler of the, of the inventory, saw a distinction between forms of religious and dynastic or sultanic authority, the topics of the subsections of Siyar and Tevari. The Tevari, which is the plural word for history, right? Tarih Tevari section begins with Ottoman histories and continues with the story of Alexander and then moves on to political historical works. Tebari's histories is also represented here with both its Arabic original and three Persian translations. The Tevari section clearly privileges Persianate and Mongol or post-Mongol histories, including the illustrated history of, of Genghis Khan and three volumes of an unillustrated Jami el Tevari. Um, so, and other examples of the history of Timur included here point to the privileged position these works held in the Ottoman cultural milieu. The Ottomans were also aware of the tradition of illustrating Timur's life, the, the Zafarname. An Ottoman translation of it was made, in fact, in the first half of the 16th century. 
So Fleischer and Schein's concluding remarks about the treasury inventory's historical section emphasize the importance of the Timurite cultural environment for the Ottomans, as well as pointing to the Ottoman claims to be the continuators of several traditions that included Sunni Islam and Turco-Mongol dynasticism. It is this that we observe in both Arif's Shehname Ali Osman and in Lokman's Zümdet Tevari. Arif and Lokman both had access to the books in the treasury and prepared their works based on these. In the case of Lokman, he also clearly consulted Arif's works too, the scroll being the most obvious one, which were by then in the treasury. Building on a palimpsest of sources, the two official historians created distinct images for the rulers they were serving. Ver verbal arguments first put forward by Arif in the Shahname Ali Osman project found their visual counterpart in the Zubdetu Tevari and linked the Ottoman rulers to the prophetic uh, past, now visually as well as verbally. Thank you. So much. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. So uh, I do have a lot of questions, but I'm going to spare you from that. So uh, uh, I, I think we have at least 15 to 20 minutes for Q&A. Please go ahead. Can you do, do, you yeah, yeah, do that? No, 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 no. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Yeah. So then they produced this, and you said there were like three uh, copies of the Shahnama or Suleiman Nama. Uh -huh. Who is really the audience? Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so these books are. Um, so the three copies that were made for the Sultan, the eunuch, and the Grand Vizier, the Grand Vizier would have taken his book to his own home, which is also a huge palace with lots of people working in it. And the uh, eunuch lived in the imperial palace, so he kept it there, probably. So these books that are kept in the Topkapı uh, Palace treasury were checked out by the pages who are in training at the palace. So I've looked at um, inventories that, of the treasury, which have the names of the books written down, just like library records today, or it's all electronic today, but you know, in our youth. And the names of the people who checked them out are written next to them and then crossed off, including the Sultan himself. So the books circulate very much in the palace, and the palace is a large population of about 2,000 people. And the young men who are, and the women, who are living in the palace and are being groomed to be the next generation of the ruling elite are, of course, coming from all over the empire, right? You probably know the Ottomans had this system whereby uh, they took especially non-Muslim children from the areas that they had recently conquered, brought them into the imperial palaces or other palaces and forced them to convert to Islam and change their names, but also allowed them to sort of work in the various um, um, branches of the government that they were talented for. And these are the people that then became the Grand Vizier and the other members of the Imperial Council. So the books are being made in order, they're propaganda instruments, right? To influence the elite, both the elite of today or of the day that they're made in, but also the future generations of the elite because these young people grow up, well, they're taken as teenagers, but still they have some growing up to do in the palace reading these things. So th that's the main audience. Ah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, we do have, so I don't know if this, or the book, the specific book that I talked about was narrated, but we do have portraits of Ottoman sultans interspersed with images of Shahname scenes in large format albums that were clearly used in public settings for storytelling. So definitely some imperial portraits were discussed in you know coffee houses etc yeah but these specific books I, I don't have evidence but what I can tell you the large format 
tells me that they're being used in a group setting. So it's not one person sitting down with a book, but it's rather a group like us looking at it, discussing it, and they also had very um, uh, connoisseurial conversations about, oh, well, this artist's not as skillful as the one we looked at last week, etc. And we have records of, of these kinds of gatherings. So in salons, let's say. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. So we have the names of some of them from wage, wage registers. Um, there are very few signed paintings, but it's also important to remember that these are mostly team projects. So you would have one person specializing in the composition, someone else doing the faces, another one very good at trees, or someone's good at painting water scenes, etc. So they're mostly collective products. So Akala Chalabi. He's the author. He's the author. Right. Now the other question I have, uh -huh. many of these miniatures and paintings are sold in the Czech Republic. Yes. Uh, what happens to the miniatures? Do they go to That is from the strength of the Persian artistic tradition. Remember I said in the beginning how, yes, these are products of political conversations, but they also very much embody very strong artistic traditions, both literary arts and visual arts. And in the Persian painting tradition, we have a strong connection to China. And in Persian poetry, there's very much, the, and Persian poetry underlies the logic of all of these things, there's this very strong notion that a Chinese face, moon-like, round, is the description of beauty. So of course, these idealized figures are shown as beautiful as possible. So that's the link to... Does that mean that a lot of these artists are actually Chinese? No, not at all. It no. It's just the visual tradition in which they're trained and practiced. They've probably forgotten that it has anything to do with China at this point. Yeah. Yes. So on a similar note, uh -huh. I have two questions. One is, would the author of any of these books supervise the whole company? Yes. And they would go through and approve these illustrations uh -huh. uh, one by one and so on, right? So they reflect the, the author uh, and, and the artist is mainly the, the illustrator of the book. Well, let me put it this way, it depends on the project and who the artist and who the author are, because strong personalities, you know. But in general, the authors in the palace, function, the, the court historian, functions also like a project director. So I've looked at, um, the, not represented here at all, a whole other project where we have three different drafts from different points of the project, and you can see um, the author first working out the text from one draft to the other, and then the next version, in the third version, he, uh, who, he's telling a scribe, because you also have a scribe who's writing the text out, to leave specific spaces empty for illustration, and in those empty spaces in one of the drafts that I looked at, there are instructions things that say, put two trees here and a guy sitting under it, or show a ruler enthroned, etc. Layout, yeah. And my other point was, this is on top of the Byzantine civilization. Yes. Which lasted for almost a thousand years. Yeah. And yet, only an example, not part of this, is mentioned. Uh -huh. And no Caesars, all these great rulers of this part of the world, of the world, are not mentioned. Is that, like, is that totally eastward looking? No question. Mm. No, uh, in fact, I mean, I didn't mention them today because they're not in the images, but the Ottomans had a very strong sense of recreating the Roman Empire and modeling themselves after not only the rulers of Rome, but also the rulers of Constantinople. So you have the mosques, for example, built at this time, built very much to uh, uh, mimic the Hagia Sophia, the, um, uh, the, the cathedral church in, in, in Constantinople that was built in the 6th century because to them, 
And it's interesting that they copy the Hagia Sophia, which is from 532 to 537, rather than a later Byzantine church, um, which would have been more recently made and so perhaps was more you know, in the right fashion. But the Hagia Sophia for them is the link to Rome. So the Roman Empire is very much front and center in the Ottoman rulers' conceptualizations of themselves. And in fact, that's what they call themselves, the emperors of Rome, which means the Roman lands. Yeah, thank you, yes. Going down the say the eighteen hundreds and so forth or late seventeen hundreds, did did it suddenly dry up or did it continue or was it uh... No, nothing dries up. So artistic traditions change despite what um you know, uh, so these illustrated histories are mostly made for like 50 years, between 1550 and 1600. After that, there's a rising interest in um, putting together albums, which are like scrapbooks, but I hate using that word because albums have a logic to them and scrapbooks don't. So you have a compilation of images that are juxtaposed with poetry to make certain art historical statements or in the case of albums made for the rulers, political statements as well. So um, we have, you know, uh, changing artistic traditions and other, other books are made, other projects are made, uh, eventually wall painting and oil on canvas, etc. keeps changing. But um, there is a continued tradition of portrait, imperial portrait making right up to the end of the Ottoman Empire in the 1920s. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but you know, just like these books are made to reflect contemporary concerns and they show Adam and Noah the way they wanted to remember them, these TV series are showing the Ottomans in the ways in which the contemporary audience wants to see them or the contemporary makers want to remember them. They're fiction, right? They're, fic they're fictional. They're based on history, but they're works of fiction and they take artistic license. Yeah. In columns. On the side, and it really determined, or it, some of them would look like columns, mm -hmm. and then it changed the perspective of the composition, leading to the genealogies where the prose, the Ottoman prose, is distinctly separated. Mm -hmm. So there's a separation between image and text. Is, is there a political or cultural importance to that? Um, so the separation of image and text. It seems uh, it, so yes, some of the verse is yes, right. Th that's right. But also in the um, certainly the layout of the page depends very much on whether the written page depends very much on whether you have poetry or prose, just like you've identified, because poetry is written in rhyming couplets, so you always have an even number of columns going down the page, whereas the prose is written all the way across. The scripts that they use, the font, let me say in modern terms, is also different based on whether they're writing poetry or prose, so that changes the appearance of things a little bit as well. 
Um, in terms of the relationship between image and text, we also have, uh, I mean, like these examples, but other, other ones too, we have words and, words and images sharing the text in prose works as well. So, so I think that there I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. No, I'm just curious. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. having the, the monopoly on history. Is there, a, is there one that is preferred for writing history? Um, they're both, so they're both used for writing history, but Persian prose for history dies out eventually as things become localized and Ottomanized, and they prefer to use the Ottoman vernacular for writing history versus the Persian, which is not the spoken language of the Ottomans. It's very much the language of literature at court and elsewhere. So in the late 16th, early 17th century, just as these books are written, and a, a generation, you know, like 10 years later, not a full generation, you see preferences shifting in all sorts of ways to local so even poetry begins to be written more in Ottoman Turkish, and the images in poetry, for example, become more localized. So you don't have an unidentified beloved being discussed, but rather you have a beloved that lives in the city of Istanbul being discussed. Or you have specific urban scenes making their way into the poetry, unlike more generic urban scenes in the poetry. So there's very much a movement in uh, movement towards localization, whether it's in language or in imagery or in visual language. Uh, but if you're written at, if you, sorry, if you look at the, um, the, 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 the text is written in Nasq, the running text. Um, Sorry, the, it moves very slowly, but the, the, the running text is very much Nasq, and you can read it a lot more easily. <laughs> Here. And it's, it's also a perfectly vocalized Nasq, too, so, yeah. Um, I have a question about, I think it was the first or second slide, but there were two images next to each other, and the caption um, mentioned that one of them was um, from the epic of Suleiman and the other was from the history of Suleiman. Mm -hmm. Then the history of Suleiman never came up again in the later slide. Right. So, is, so what is the distinction between the epic and the history and, and when Murad came along, does he also have a history to go along with the So, uh, yeah, thank you. So the history of Suleiman is written during Murad's reign and it's 80 years later. It's by the same historian that's responsible for this work. But it is also in Persian verse. I showed it as an example of, sorry, here you can see the, the Nasq text, right? So I showed the history of Suleiman as an example of a book that focuses on the reign of a single ruler. Um, that's why I, I put it up there. But it's written in Persian verse. It's written in the uh, Nasq, in the Talik uh, text, so hanging text. Um, but it's by Lokman who's responsible for this Ottoman prose uh, work. It's his, in fact, first imperial commission from 1579. I guess I'm, I'm, my question is also about, like, generically, like, mm -hmm. for this era, the genre of, of, of Suleiman Epic, epic versus, versus history. history. Right, so the, the problem has to do a little bit with translation in, of the titles into English, right? So the official title of the five-volume project, the Shahname of the House of Osman, of which the Book of Suleiman is the fifth volume. You're right, does not mention the word history. Whereas Lokman's work from 1579 is literally called the Tarikh, or the history of Sultan Suleiman. Um, but it is very similar in nature to the contents of the of the what you're calling the epic of Suleiman or what, what the book of Suleiman. 
Does that, so obviously the distinction that we make today between history and epic is not there in the same way in the 16th century. <laughs> Idealized, let's say. Yes, in the very back. Thank you. Uh, it's a very impressive example of the inclusion of diverse parts in one narrative. But since this tradition existed for a long time, and you have different words of one text and different drafts, mm -hmm. have you met any examples of the opposite trend, exclusion of some figures, erasure of these figures, of course. Of pictures? So if it is propaganda, can we trace any uh, signs of policing of the past? Uh-huh. Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, but one way of police, policing is to destroy, right? So by non-existence, some of these works speak for themselves. And these, the books that I'm showing you, for the most part, or entirely, are commissions from the palace. So they are written for, for those in power. And they're illustrated for those in power, and so they show that perspective. Um, but I have, for example, um, <clears throat> I'm remembering this, this specific example where one um, historian talks about another historian's work, and he says, well, that guy who told the story of the, the conquest of Yemen, he made the whole thing look like it was the uh, brainchild or, the, or the, 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 the accomplishment of this one general. But really, we know that the work was done entirely by, by this other person. So when I read this, what did it make me think? First, just like you're saying, two different voices. One of them favors one person. The other one favors another one. Absolutely. But also, to those in the know, because he says also, but for those of us who know the actual events, we all know who the real hero was. So when you think of these things, prepared for an audience that lived through the events, of course, they know things in a way that you and I, living in 2023, don't, because we weren't there to experience it. So only when there are multiple accounts of the same thing can I triangulate and see whose version is, is preferred. And we don't always have that. But there are many uh, histories without paintings in them that criticize the, the royal house or specific individuals that are in power, and these things were allowed to exist and come, come to our day. There are certainly, there's certainly a lot of um, poems that criticized the ruler. The poet may have been killed, but his lines have remained. So there's, there's certainly uh, dissent and literature of dissent as well, yeah. Uh, yes, so there's a book of um, imperial portraits, just portraits, just like the, the last part of this, but that one's a freestanding work by the same author, actually, um, has a very long title, um, but it's a book of physiognomy, and the beginning is a manual that says things like, if a person has curly hair, they will have this kind of character. If they have a red and white complexion, they're like this. If they have a lion-like nose, they are brave. But if they have a ram-like nose, they are stubborn. It's, I'm making it up, but you, you get the drift. But hold on, give me a second. So the, then, then he says, but here are the likenesses of the sultans, and they are not like any human being. So we cannot use these rules to apply to the images that are in this book. But then you have the image of the ruler and then an account of his reign, of the events, etc. But you also have a verbal description of what they looked like. And the verbal description is exactly, he had a lion-like nose, he had curly hair, he had, you know, whatever. And so you can see these features in the images, so we, we can actually recognize these types. One of the sultans is always shown with a mustache, never a beard. One of them clearly had reddish hair, 
etc., and, and blue eyes, and the images, all of his portraits continue this. Now, they don't have a sense of verisimilitude. They're not trying to make us think that that person is present, but it's almost like they took the list of what this guy looks like, his hair's like this, his cheeks are like that, blah, 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 and his clothes also are a part of that equation, and the image produces that for you, not in a lifelike fashion, because they're not interested in doing that, but in a way that you can recognize the person or identify the person. Sorry, I stopped you, but does that help? Well, but I was thinking, for example, a portrait uh -huh. of the, one of the Sultan or the Uh huh. Like, yeah. Aren't there any? Well, Sultan? these are the portraits. But these are in, in a book. Yes. So their main artistic medium is painting in books until the 18th, 19th century. There is an oil painting of, uh, of Mehmet II uh, from the middle of the 15th century where he very famously invites an Italian artist to his court to make his portrait. He also invites other Italian artists to make um, uh, medallion coins with his appearance, etc. But these are not works that are addressing the local Ottoman audience. These are, especially the coins, they have Latin inscriptions on them, not Arabic. They're not for local consumption. They're, he's trying to talk with people elsewhere. So um, their artistic tradition is in books. So that's, that's what they do. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so <coughs> actually when this was written, mm -hmm. it's like, uh, 1580s, so 16th century. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm surprised that they relied mostly on like, uh, Persian literature. Uh -huh. uh, for instance, are you familiar with Ibn Khaldun? Of course. Production? Yeah. So he wrote that around the 13th century. Sure. So I'm surprised that but it, he rationalized the way to write history. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, they reviewed the battles that happened in the past, and of course, as you mentioned, like, the guys moved from Egypt and there were 600,000 people. Yeah. So Ibn Khaldun tried to rationalize like some yeah. of the battles when they claimed there were uh, 200,000 uh, combatants in the battle. He said, well, the land cannot support that many people. Right. So there was much, much more advanced thinking about how to write history. And I'm, I'm surprised they didn't read really they did, actually. I mean, Ibn Khaldun is also one of the models that Ottoman historians use to conceive of the way they describe their rulers. I didn't mention it here because for... Well, his name is not mentioned here, but it's mentioned elsewhere in other books, just not in the examples I'm talking about today. But he's very much one of the... And other historians who wrote in Arabic are, are also part of the um, intellectual... Uh, heritage or inheritance, let's say, of, of the Ottomans. Absolutely. In fact, all of these guys trained at the palace, they can read three languages. They all read Arabic, Persian, and Ottoman Turkish. So, and the palace collections have, to this day, have these books in Arabic and in Turkish and in Persian. They were organized in the, the treasury lists by language. They were kept in different sections by language. So they, they, these are also their models too. Yeah. Not so much visually, I guess, right? Because the Shahnameh comes with paintings. So in terms of a visual tradition, Ibn Haldun isn't illustrated, wasn't illustrated at the time, and so there aren't images for them to be inspired by, but there are certainly words for them to be inspired by. Please. So, um, Persian words, Shehname, so, and of course we know the popularity of Shehname, I'm not going to go how it is translated also and use it in the Arabic, you know, Arab, <coughs> you know, Arab provinces and uh -huh. so forth, so I'm, I was skipped up, but I was curious, since some of these works, as you mentioned in your presentation, produced in Persian, and of course we always think as the main counterpart, as the Salvadans, uh -huh. I was curious with your also interest in Mughal interactions uh -huh. with the and the Do you think they might be also in their mind mm -hmm. when they are, especially in the later part of the 16th century, when they are producing these works in Persian, 
Mm -hmm. um, possibly, and in, especially at the very end of the 16th century, and in fact, one of the Persian verse accounts of one of the battles or campaigns of Mehmet III, who was the son of Murat here, who ruled at the very end of the 16th century, you know this, but for the audience, 1595 to 1603, his history with the paintings in it was sent to the Mughal court. It has the seal of one of the Mughal princesses in it and is today in, in a library in India. So maybe not when it's made, but it's, it's sent clearly as a high level diplomatic gift. So yeah, yeah, thank you.